Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti a Giovedì Scienza. Welcome to Giovedì Scienza Science on a Thursday. Welcome to the Turin Polytechnic. I always uh, remind you that a round of applause does not go amiss, especially when it's spontaneous. Um, this evening we have a lot of people sitting with us here, and so I would like to introduce you. Without any further ado, I would like to remind all of you, and in particular to our guests, uh, what the gong players can do. They are warmly invited to interrupt only once each at any moment, asking whatever they wish, referring to the conference. Uh, so let's try both the mics so we get to know the two Buonasera. gong players. Io sono Rosanna. Rosanna. Buonasera, Tommaso. Tommaso. Benissimo. My name is Tommaso. So let me try the gong. Di direi che funziona. I would suggest it works. So now Continuing with the introductions, right next to them we have um, a biologist who is a scientific journalist and a popularizer. He works for Valigia Blue blog, the blue suitcase, politics, but also a lot about science, Antonio Scalari. And then we have a journalist who studies uh, social dynamics in uh, social networks. And then we will ask her what she's done, and uh, that's Antonella Vicini. And let me introduce an IT specialist, that's at least uh, what he started off as, but then he studied logic and psychologist and now works at the Venice Ca Foscari University where he manages a, a data science and complexity lab, uh, Walter Quattrociocchi. And we've already had the opportunity to meet him two or three years ago. Welcome back. And then here we have a science uh, journalist. Uh, Yes, uh, it's 50 years since uh, people walked on the moon, and uh, I have been, I had already been working uh, for six years then, so 56 years. With all these guests this afternoon, we will be talking about lots of things, uh, fake news, uh, truth, uh, lies, and how they spread, and how we can defend ourselves. But as a guiding theme, I'm sure my guests can correct me if I'm mistaken, there is one idea, that is that as human beings, we are not rational beings. And we have to accept the fact. I don't know if it sounds a bit like a pun, but that's what it is. We live in a world which is extremely complex and we are trying to interpret it and we take shortcuts that are not always the best. We are easily conditioned, we believe lies, but without any further ado now I'd like to give the floor to Antonio Scalari. Yes, there was a question, but I would have asked him immediately after. I'm going to give him the floor. Uh, he will talk about fake news. That is uh, not a new topic, uh, but relatively recent. What do we mean by fake news? Is it just a novelty? Does it only concern the internet? But before giving him the floor, I have a question for the audience. Who can tell me? how the main local paper is called. Nearly everybody knows that. Uh, it's uh, the liar 
Stamper. Well, I will not comment, uh, but give him the floor. Good evening to you all. Thank you very much. Yes, we're talking about fake news, but not only about fake news. Uh, to debate this topic, which has surfaced um, in the past few years, today we'll be talking about what truth is. Just a minor topic. Uh, what is truth um, and what is our daily relationship with truth uh, and information and the media and the information that we have every day on social media, but not only on social media. Since we have to say the truth, uh, we have to say truth about the post-truth, and we could go on and on about this. So we could uh, disband the post-truth that we are living in the era of post-truth. This uh, debate is full of short circuits uh, like this. We are not living in the era of post-truth because invention and fake news has always been with us. Uh, and the media, journals, newspapers, uh, magazines um, have, uh, to a degree, circulated uh, invented news. Uh, so uh, not La Stampa as in the name of the newspaper, but La Stampa in the sense of the press. <clears throat> for example, for today's conference, uh, I don't know if you've uh, chosen have you seen the image that was chosen for today's debate, which is this one? It is a 19th century reprint, which picks up on news that was published on The Sun, that was a New York newspaper of the time, very well known. And they were attributing this to Herschel, a great, the great astronomer. And according to this, uh, with his great means for the time, Herschel would have allegedly seen uh, aliens on the moon. Clearly, there was absolutely nothing true. It was a joke, fake news, but this bears witness uh, of uh, how this relationship between press and information has always been very complex. Uh, in this case, uh, the intention was uh, to make fun uh, of readers, uh, but um, we could list a number of others. I've discovered on the internet that there is a museum of fake uh, that news that uh, has a number of front pages with hundreds of uh, bits of information. For example, in 1874, they had panic uh, in the streets of New York because the news had circulated that uh, the animals had escaped from the zoo. And if we jump forward by a century in 1991, they said uh, that Russia was about to throw out Lenin's, uh, and uh, there was a joke of corpse or not, but um, it was fake. And without skipping a century, there were slightly more serious things, uh, uh, like uh, the Sages of Zion, uh, which attributed uh, to Jews or the evil of the world, and that certainly did cause problems in 1994. The word went round that Microsoft wanted to buy the Catholic Church. Don't ask me why, what interest Microsoft would have had in doing this. But in 1994, it's the time they start using the word fake news. It's not a new expression, so 
It, was, it has been used ever since then. Unquestionably, people have been talking a lot about fake news, especially uh, since uh, Trump uh, has uh, been elected President of the United States. Uh, why? Because according to some, his um, rise to the White House was uh, favored uh, by the circulation of fake news, uh, in particular by some uh, blogs uh, that uh, were based in Macedonia. And from Macedonia and from the Balkans, uh, they were circulating a lot of information. Now, whether this had an impact on Trump's uh, information or Brexit uh, is something more complicated uh, and clearly it's not like this, but we might debate it. Uh, however, unquestionably, people have been talking about fake news, especially in relation to major social and political events like elections in the US, in France, uh, the referendum in the UK, and so on. People have been talking about it, and every time that you start using repeatedly, every day, a word or an expression, inevitably, it's virtually a law, that word or of that word, we start to misuse. So it means everything in the opposite. We start talking about fake news in relation to anything. So not only to define the real fake news, uh, the ready-made, deliberately made fake news uh, to circulate it. But for example, all the things we don't like become fake news. Uh, so what happens? That fake news uh, in the political debate uh, becomes uh, an ac accusation. Fake news are the news uh, that other people will circulate. Uh, so inevitably, the word is uh, stretched every two minutes, and it acquires uh, meanings uh, that is very different, and you lose the center. This photo, for example, is a photo because uh, of Trump, because Trump is very often accused uh, by the media against him uh, that he is circulating fake news or in his opinion, uh, they misdescribe his political activity. So we have again this, what do you mean by fake news? Is it a tainted term? Is it the opposite of truth uh, when you're talking about information? And rightly, this journalist, uh, Sullivan, in the US, uh, said, wait a minute, we're starting to misuse fake news. We're talking about fake news. Uh, maybe it's time we laid it aside. It's had its 15 minutes of fame. And maybe we should ask ourselves a few more questions. Questions on what? What do we de mean when we say fake news? Is it false? Is it truth? Do they exist? Is it like black and white? Is everything either true or false? Or are they shades? An unknown land that separates the truth from false with all the possible nuances. This study, for instance, tried to understand uh, how or what the use of the word fake news was in 2017 to try and understand how it was used and to mean what. In the end, fake news is an umbrella word which is used uh, for everything, fake manipulation, satire, for example, in the Lercio case in Italy, how many people don't understand the difference between fact and fiction? And sometimes I must say, I must confess that I too find it difficult uh, to tell the one from the other. When is it that 
reality exceeds imagination or vice versa. But for instance, advertising, misleading advertising, how many times have we heard this expression? Advertising is not aimed exactly to say exactly how things are. The aim of advertising is uh, uh, to describe a product and to make it attractive for consumers. Then there's propaganda. So there are a series of nuances of truth, decontextualized truth, headlines, even sometimes in papers, misquotes. If you put something in quotes, it means that you're quoting. If the statement of a politician or of a famous person is um, modified, changed, even by a word, it may change meaning completely. And in some cases, uh, media, the media are either superficial or in haste, and they do not quote correctly. So, Let's eliminate another post-truth that whereby the problem of information only concerns social networks. No, it does not only concern the social media, but anything that belongs to the information ecosystem, anything that has to do with information that we see every day, that are part of our lives, are come under this definition every day, just as we eat every day. We also eat, so to speak, information, uh, which are then conveyed through the social media and television. And then there is a range of different fake news bits. And for example, the clickbait that is to say, some titles uh, that are used, or headlines that are used as bait to get people to click. They may be truths uh, that are factually true, but are con in a context that alters them or that um, gets them to say something which they did not mean to say. So the problem of the context uh, and the context that is used to get them to convey a different idea as compared to what they meant. So we have information disorder too. If this is the picture, which is very complex, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, there's not just true and false, but there is a more complex problem. That is to say, a problem that we might define it as the Council of Europe has information disorder, chaos, which is the best definition to describe not just today, but what we've always had. We have misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and in this chaos, uh, we also have hate speech, racist speech, that is to say, all those statements that are made to affect someone in this information ecosystem. The system is not only polluted by fake news, but by all this speech and discourses that damage social environment, a range of, uh, very complex range of misinformation that we're going to call called information disorder or chaos. It is important also to establish not just to classify uh, and be like an entomologist of fake news, but to try and understand what the basic information is, why someone might be interested in circulating the wrong information. I was saying it earlier on. 
profit might be a reason, for example, misleading advertising, deliberately misleading, hiding some particular details, does so to make a product more appealing, propaganda, the manipulation of satire. But in red, I have in particular bad journalism because unfortunately in this chaos, as I mentioned, one role, one of the actors is journalism. Journalists uh, should be the ones uh, which or who in society have the task uh, of verifying facts, of being a filter for all the information circulating. But unfortunately, this role is something that journalists do not fulfill correctly. For example, the Washington Post uh, the Washington Post had published a non-verified news item on an electrical grid in Vermont. So I don't know if you've heard reference to the hacking or presumed hacking from Russia, which aimed at polluting the debate in the US. So this bit of information caused a great upstir, especially because it came from the Washington Post. Again, in the case, if you remember, in 2014, uh, there was that uh, devastating epidemic of Ebola in Africa. Do you remember all the false alarms? Uh, Every now and again in Italy, there was someone whose uh, only fault was that of being an African. And so every now and again, there were these false alarms. And you will well appreciate the fact uh, that uh, Ebola and migrants uh, were a very dangerous mix uh, and could become politically explosive. So every now and again, there were these rather curious events whereby there were some Twitter accounts uh, on television or even well-known uh, newspapers that within quarter of an hour would publish the information and then disproving it. It was a false alarm and referred to the mo what had happened in the morning. The fact, if such fact existed, it was no longer true and had been known for an hour, but clearly the Twitter account, in this case of uh, TG7, in this case it was them, but in other cases there were others. It was also the Corriere della Sera. As if, without a human being but a bot, that published uh, both the information and then the counter-information, but sometimes uh, people don't re read it uh, and therefore remain convinced uh, that there was an Ebola case in Rome. A Somali bleeds. What does that mean? Bleeding from the nose? Had a nose bleed? Blood in Ebola, blood bleeding from the nose. It's a very late syndrome with Ebola but there were all sorts of bits of news suggesting that your internal organs would sort of blend, melt down. In those months, um, there was all that news or fake news going around. Or, for example, the 7.1 earthquake immediately after the big 6.5 quake, there had been this other news item 
7.1 or 7.5 may see made detail for a seismologist, but in any case, it was a mistaken information. And from a seismological point of view, it's a major difference. Uh, but uh, seeing seven instead of six, uh, clearly the means the readership reacts differently. As Valija Blue, we had reconstructed, uh, retraced uh, this 7.1 fake news because um, it had been circulated by all the papers in Italy without any distinction. There have been in television, radio, papers, so without. Uh, I had also contacted uh, the, they'd contacted the US geological system that had said uh, that they had never circulated anything like that. But in any case, uh, the first uh, source of this uh, appears to have been Reuters, uh, which is the Bible of uh, new press agencies. For some reason, Reuters India circulated the information with results. Uh, I think this is absolutely beautiful. The the Twitter account of the regional news reel that was corrected. Very beautiful. 7.4, the lack of intermediation. I mean, who's going to offer more? Eight, nine. And here again, it's less true now, but in the case of an earthquake, especially in India, there had been the idea, the legend, according to which um, the order of magnitude of uh, quakes uh, were lowered, uh, fakely lowered, because below a certain level, the state uh, did not refund damage. I think the Monti government at the time was in power, and the fact that initially all the media media that people trust, uh, because this is the problem, because even in the lack of intermediation, it's not that people um, trust everything, but they trust television. You're a newspaper, if you say 7.1, you're the one person who has to verify it. The fact that <coughs> they had given the right figure might have uh, encouraged uh, the suspicion that they were lowering the, misleadingly lowering the levels. This uh, is the following uh, either bombings or natural catastrophes or things like this. It's very easy that uh, some information, unconfirmed, unverified information will be circulated. This is something which has to do with science, uh, too. Here you can see scientific um, information. For those of you who have scientific information on your desk, when there's a study by a university department, uh, the information enters uh, the cycle of uh, news, uh, and it's as if uh, it were losing bits of truth, shedding truth, uh, being oversimplified, and this was necessary. And uh, we have to explain or translate, so to speak. We have to communicate, circulate this uh, study, and therefore a minimum of simplification is necessary. Then of this uh, simplification, the media are also responsible. There's correlations that become causality and uh, so on and so forth. That this is uh, something that shows you it, the situation degenerates. But those of you who are involved in scientific information, we have an issue of how to contextualize information. The media are interested in uh, novelties, uh, and uh, they assess new studies uh, on, on the basis of uh, known information. 
And I'd like to conclude in saying, I said that we are living in a post-truth era, and I hope that we're all aware of this. I don't want us to forget that fake exists. I don't want us to be too concerned with the problem of post-truth only in relation to what happens on social media because um, there has been there have been a series of manipulations as you can see in this photo from our archives which led to a war on the basis of uh, unverified intelligence and never confirmed and if you bear in mind the fact that the war in Iraq triggered a series of events that led to ISIS and so on well fake and manipulation can certainly cause damage but it's not a new problem uh, but in the era of social media has exploded because the social media asks us or we ask them how they circulate and to find new ways to circulate but I think that my colleagues will be talking about that too which is more interesting than what I could say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Antonio Scalari. Now let's give the floor to Walter Quattrociocchi and Antonella Vicini, who I think agree on the idea that fake news is nothing new. They don't start with the internet, but it is true that uh, with the internet, the way in which they're circulated changes. Post verità, no? <coughs> Post verità, fake Post news. Truth. Uh, fake uh, news. There are uh, many definitions. The most beautiful definition is comes from a Facebook friend that defines it uh, as the era where everybody explains what they don't know what they're talking about. Um, yes, because access to information has facilitated uh, understanding and uh, but we, without us all just having the tools uh, to understand. The first group were the journalists who to a degree were pressed for, by information and the need to have authoritative information and a world where you need speed. That's why withdrawing uh, information is uh, not uh, guilty. There is uh, information that travels very quickly and uh, we are not as intelligent, savvy, rational as we would like to believe. So much so that uh, we have uh, been filled idea with the, our heads with the idea of fake news invasion and so on. It has become a topic in itself, a means to speak as if the truth and false were something which is debated in philosophy, but fake, this is fake news too. So the idea that something is true or false, are we really sure that it's so important? We're carrying out a study which shows that whereby that we like to use, uh, we're lazy, we like to use as little information as possible. We don't read a lot anymore, we like to watch news. So fake news versus uh, truth uh, is something which uh, frightens me. It reminds me of the Middle Ages, uh, uh, the uh, Holy Office of the Vatican, or this is a fake zebra. Is this fake news or fake zebra? Here, 
We have a context. This one, too. Is this a fake news? I shared it. I think it's amusing. Never give up. In three years, you will become like this. He's also changing color. I don't know if you noticed. Three-year challenge. Oxford Dictionary in 2016 defined post-truth as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts and less influential than shaping public opinion then appeals to emotion and personal belief. That means that when we make a decision, we allow ourselves to be, in fact, influenced by subjective cases rather than objective ones. The most objective fact is okay, but objective in itself can only be an aim. But in 2016, we discovered that human beings are not rational, that uh, they are influenced by emotions. Science has uh, progressed in this. Then we have something else, which is the fact that we are constantly bombarded by information. Look at the number of posts and so on. This was 2018. It's now increased. Uh, the, there's an enormous amount of information. Apparently, in the past two or three years, more content has been produced uh, than uh, from the beginning of the first Sumerian tablet to 2016. This amount of information is enormous, unmanageable. I'll tell you more in detail what we saw, but in any case, I'd like to give the floor to Antonella because she, her task was that of translating in words I'm already complex in my thinking, but she is uh, supposed to translate this. And so we've written two books that we did with my group. I'm only taking advantage of the fact that uh, Free to Believe, uh, by, published by Codice. In fact, uh, it uh, was work in progress for me because we met uh, on Facebook uh, because in 2014 you published the first study where you and your working group uh, had correlated uh, the gullibility of uh, uh, users on the internet um, with a tendency to follow alternative uh, beliefs uh, we've written an, I wrote an article and uh, uh, thereafter we started discussing things uh, that I was already discussing with my colleagues because we were starting uh, to ask ourselves uh, why those uh, who seek alternative narrative uh, threads uh, are the ones uh, who are most governable we didn't know yet. We were uh, trying to analyze a phenomena that was new. Walter and his team started working on it, measured it mathematically, and not just mathematically, statistically. What uh, I could see as a user, and they discovered something which is very important, uh, which in my opinion, from their studies, is the primary driver people in the network, users, but in general. But we can say that it's easier with the net. People seek the information on the basis of what they're looking for. It seems to be a paradox, but basically it means that I am not a blank screen to know something. I have a system of beliefs. I have a personality, a past, that means that I seek a certain type of information that has to confirm my system of belief. It's a loop. 
It's something that I or them have not discovered. It's women well known. These are well known mechanisms underlying knowledge uh, development in a world which is a complex and fast, uh, such as today's, uh, full of information. And this means uh, that everyone has less time to think about the information. And you go on a bit like um, an automatic pilot, uh, which is uh, their mechanisms that make it possible for us to use less energy and to satisfy our needs. Uh, there's a book uh, by Kahneman that talks about um, how this type of thought is also easier to use uh, because it uses less glucose, less energy. So each and every one of us, when we seek information, we're trying to satisfy our needs very quickly. And the internet, thanks or due to the lack of intermediation of the web, the information that we have is very plentiful. Some are right, some are wrong. But they're not, there's not necessarily misguiding or deliberately misguiding because people make mistakes. Journalists, uh, we uh, make mistakes because we're called to fill columns uh, very, very quickly and with information. And very often, we have to compete with our colleagues because uh, we have to come out with the news before the others. Uh, this means uh, that um, the environment of the network becomes very complex um, and also is an environment where Should we talk about the echo chambers? You do it. We want to finish something. It becomes a very complex environment where, which reproduces existing mechanism but on another scale with the consequences that we see day after day. The problem is bigger than what we think. It's different from what is said. And uh, there's also narrative because fake news in itself has become a way to exercise something which uh, exists. I'm going to try and explain it in a very easy manner. The approach, scientifically, how do we approach it? It was the time that people were start five years ago were starting to talk about the amount of data that was being poured on us. Uh, there were also resistance in the academic world uh, because um, uh, they thought uh, that it was not really a topic. Uh, it was social science, but computer science, and so on. But the topic uh, has become accepted, and it is uh, the focus on uh, the spread of fake news through social media. It's become one of the problems of the century. We had very simple tools. We didn't have miracles. On the left, to give you an idea of the tools that we have, here the state of New Jersey. Colors identify the geographic areas where certain languages spoken. How did they create this map? Using the tweets that people used. You know what Twitter is. How many of you know about it? Raise your hands. Not many. Facebook? But you all know what Twitter is. Twitter is a platform of social media where we can only use initially 150, 120, but now 200 characters. Uh, but our geographical position is also taken. We took these tweets, not us, these, the group. We saw what language they were in, and they were localized on the map, located uh, with uh, the, here you can see the distribution of uh, languages in New Jersey. 
we had a lot of data and we could start piecing things together uh, rather than uh, just uh, guessing. Bottom right, you have uh, uh, the Occupy movement and how people spoke and how they were linked. All this uh, focuses on the U.S., but beware, because science is not exoterism. Things are not necessarily true or always true or true forever if you write it in a scientific paper. That's clear, isn't it? Right. Science is an honest attempt, mostly an honest attempt, to understand things. This, these two examples have a fault. It's not science. It's just descriptive statistics. I have represented with an image a phenomenon that I have not mentioned anything about. It was that, like that then, not now. It may have changed. I haven't said anything. Science means saying something. It's very complicated to say something valid in science. This is why communication is difficult. Um, even all the things that they say on social responsibility, I don't want to discredit science. I simply want to say that it is an attempt to get to know a complex phenomenon. But there's nature. They sample, and they say that half of the studies of social psychology cannot be replicated. That's a problem. When they say, I'd, we've discovered uh, that people who uh, sleep more live longer. Well, maybe it's a little forced, isn't it? From our point of view, the international community say, why don't we try to do things in a little bit more honestly? Why don't we try to answer questions on the basis of data that is available and leave uh, out fake news on data interpretation? But we set up experiments and we started working on uh, circulation of information. This was Ash's uh, dilemma. There are eight people in the room. One is uh, the guinea pig and the others are actors. The question is, of the three lines on the right, which one is uh, as long as uh, the one on the left? It's a quantitative answer. The experiment consists in the fact that the actors must suggest the wrong answer to the guinea pig. And this gives you a measure of how many times you get influenced by the wrong answer. We, two out of three of us uh, can be influenced uh, because uh, there were 12 out of 18 who believed it. We can be influenced. Is it always true? No, because this experiment if I change the setting, and I don't only have it uh, spoken, but I have uh, it in writing, it changes completely and it sways. Reality is very complex. And my bias was to I use uh, physics and statistical mechanics uh, to try and describe this. Uh, but you say, what's this like? what is it like here in terms of social contagion? Well, so information is like a virus, one says. Virus, viral, but I don't choose a virus. I choose information. I don't go around seeking a flu virus because the whole complexity doesn't work. You also choose. There is a, a degree of choice. So if we want to maintain the, uh, the metaphor of the virus, uh, then we have to have intentionality, trust, attitudes. 
social norms and confirmation bias. It, bias uh, comes from bie in French, which means a shortcut. It's a way of uh, circumventing. We're in a forest. We hear the leaves uh, moving. I haven't got time to see whether it is a tiger or a pussycat. I run away. Some people says that they want to emancipate themselves from bias. I've heard other people, other experts, uh, that there is uh, our rationality is how we go beyond the confirmation bias. But we can't choose without a confirmation bias. Experiments say that uh, if you have uh, damaged that part of your brain, you cannot make a decision. You stand there, so confirmation bias is essential. We shouldn't avoid it. Then there was something else, which, uh, and I'm not going to be too long. There's another element which has changed. So the physicists say that information is like viruses, but we can be misled. And then there's another thing, which is a gender setting. If newspapers and newsreels bombard us with talking about elections, we will be talking about elections. That is to say, we consider frequent items as important, especially if they are through the media. This is an enormous power of the media because it means that you select the topics you're talking about. The problem is that in the past 20, 30 years, uh, this has changed. As the internet has grown, as internet has become more important, the system has become more hybrid. There is no longer just uh, the group of journalists who select the topics uh, that are then debated in the paper or on television, but there is an activity which is user-led because there are a lot, a lot of information, a lot of sources, and they pick the information they like and then they repost it and share it with their friends. This uh, changes the mechanism. Fake news existed before, but this uh, changes the mechanism. And uh, there are media that sometimes uh, take social networks as a source. They, yes, they take all the information. Uh, they, uh, for example, Bin Laden's uh, death. Um, came, the news came through Twitter. There was no journalist there, so social networks uh, and social media have changed the way in which we use information. And then him, the pure, innocent uh, little him, uh, he does business, he's not guilty. He's got, he says, with total honesty, in 2007, he said, we don't want to create another community or other sources of information. We simply want to enable people to share information that they like best, which means uh, to destroy journalism as such, because it means uh, that you take away the information. I open the market to everyone, so much so that in terms uh, of the user, a blogger is not so different from uh, a newspaper journalist, I read it. So you compete for user attention. The problem is quality. Here you can see, see what happens if you put your fingers on the little kittens, you share the image, writing the word Ebola, and look what happens. Here you can see a platypus that becomes a billaduck, a sort of genetic uh, experiment uh, of a beaver and a duck. Um, but these are, this is not stupidity. This is intentionally a uh, Dada surrealist mechanism making fun of people because uh, knowledge has gone beyond our paradigms. We can say anything. In fact, uh, the demolition of this concept uh, is a prerogative of social media. And then we talk about journalism. 
Antonio spoke about it, so I won't repeat it. Uh, the Operation Jade Helm, uh, 2015. Um, there was during the press conference. They say the army said we're going to have a military exercise in Texas. A few hours later, through Twitter, the mistake. Uh, uh, transforming it, it became Obama's about to, to have a, a coup in Texas. Uh, everybody believed it included great Greg Abbott, uh, uh, who called the National Guard and said uh, they say that Obama is about to, to organize a coup in Texas. Uh, or this one, when the government doesn't do what people don't want, it should uh, be thrown out with stones. This was a joke uh, because we thought uh, uh, that, uh, or they thought uh, that uh, people would believe it. It was a test. What was the effect? Here you see. Are we going to throw people away with uh, sticks and stones? Uh, this is what's written. It's not, I'm not inventing it. You wrote about it. I don't know if Fertini said that, uh, because somebody says that he said it. I haven't checked it, but we like it. Yesterday, when you hear about fake news, uh, this is an example. Uh, who cares if Pertini said it or not? Uh, it was uh, possible. We put it on the flyer to invite people to come to Parliament and protest. Uh, this is um, the mechanism, true, false, true, false, true, false. We say the truth, you lie. It's all a way of in which you develop narratives uh, and fight each other. And everything can be manipulated, very fluid. This is another example. This uh, was uh, Dino Ballerini, a boy from Florence. He said the Senator Cirenia, who was uh, suggesting a law, a bill, to fund uh, uh, MPs uh, that should uh, uh, be fund refunded if they weren't uh, um, re-elected. Yeah, you talk about funds. Um, because uh, for a severance pay for MPs uh, uh, that uh, do not get elected, a shame of yourself. We have millions of visualizations, not 10. But at this point, how many of you think that there are gullible people online? Internet has voiced, uh, given a voice to thousands of stupid people. This is another bias. Feeling more intelligent than others. This is a mechanism. For instance, uh, in Italy, they've distorted the debate, so we talk uh, about those who are in favor of science and those who are against them. You're touching a very difficult topic. Now, well, the fact is that People believe they're rational and think that the others are gullible, medieval, they're bonobos, they're monkeys, they're apes. Uh, we carried out studies that showed that the rational people, or so-called rational and the bonobos, uh, behave in the same way. Their narrative is different. For example, we saw the gullible people that said, uh, uh, Cirenia Pertini, the former pr president. This is. Uh, a wired, a journal on technology that debates a very important scientific uh, uh, articles. Um, in 2015, uh, it comments an article of how information uh, and plot theories. Um, the people interviewed um, Walter Quattrocchi, Walter, Qu Walter Quattrocchi. Walter or Walter Quattrocchi comments, uh, I make a comment uh, saying, you are better because you take uh, information from Quark or Chipak. Are you better? Three minutes later, somebody says, uh, have you not read the article? My article, uh, my name comes out five times. Who hasn't read it? Him or me? When more or less we're the same. We're all the children of the same monkey. But from 2013 onwards, the World Economic Forum 
they're having the meeting in Davos just now. Uh, this says uh, that uh, the mass of uh, digital misinformation is one of the main risks uh, uh, for our society. Honestly, between 2016 and 2017, informed that report. Uh, so we contributed uh, uh, to that and identifying the phenomena as uh, changing the way in which uh, you see information and not as describing it as a war of truth against lies because that's a, no, the, a dead end road. Now a question. How many of you think uh, that fact checking, you know what fact checking is? Well, more or less. This idea that uh, journalists or il di banca, uh, they're two different jobs, but say, Mostly, in your opinion, if you believe in chemical um, weight going, curing dermatitis with lemon, if I go there and I bring all the sources and all the studies, uh, which sometimes I misquote because sometimes uh, even if you're a debunker, you can make mistakes because you can't be an expert. And I say, you are wrong. This is your uh, version, but it's wrong. How many people, how effective is it? Or you don't vaccinate your child, you're stupid. How does it work? And we're talking about facts. Vaccines work. But it, dermatitis isn't, cannot be cured with lemon. But in the worst case, uh, who has the right to decide what is true and what is false? How many people see blue and uh, this blue and black? How many see it gold and white? In a context like this, this is a lens on a dress that is uh, blue. It's a filter which uh, changes uh, the spectrum which sees it. Some people see it uh, blue and black or uh, white and gold or mixed. Um, here, in this case, uh, to expect someone to say this is true or this is false is dangerous. Uh, it is dangerous, especially because the more complicated and complex things are, and science in most cases deals with complex things. Uh, and with a degree of uncertainty, to offer a dogmatic and absolute truth is extremely dangerous uh, for a particular reason. Because when you have uh, the side effect uh, or you have a mistake, uh, while science, if science uh, presents itself as dogmatic, you have not just ruined uh, what that specific thing refers to, but the whole trend. So, to talk in the name of science is very complicated. It should not become a war of religions or a wrench uh, to fight a particular political discourse. Now, very often things are false in the internet. Albert Einstein says this. Is it true? Well, there is a double mistake here. Yeah. First of all, the picture is Bruno Lauzi, not Einstein. But he has white curly hair. More or less, they look alike. We know that Bruno Lauzi is this uh, the, because only because he's playing the guitar. Because Einstein used to play the violin, not the guitar. I'd, the Chinese are writing very good science fiction for that matter. So our brain analyzes information trying to save energy. As and Tonella was saying, Kahneman uh, uh, was a Nobel Prize for irrationality because he showed that uh, uh, economics based on rationality doesn't work. But there's a whole mechanism whereby we process information, we develop an idea, and more or less we organize the story. For the time being, this is called confirmation bias, but maybe in two years' time, it could be called uh, something differently with neuroscience. In fact, we talk about the mechanism whereby we prefer 
to search for interpret favor and uh, that correspond to our idea of truth, um, the science of social psychology. Uh, the one which cannot be reproduced in 50% of the cases uh, defines it uh, as uh, this. Uh, tomorrow it might be called, I don't know, uh, tens, uh, tendency to energy saving. But phenomenologically, our brain does this. We have, we tried a very stupid experiment. Uh, we're all able to do it. The experiment was this. We took all the sources of information, scientific of information on Facebook, uh, on Facebook, uh, and analyzed them, um, not 2,000, but on 3,055,000 people, so 370 million in another experiment, and we saw that whether if you consume information on plots, uh, how likely is it that you are going to share or agree with uh, a meme or an image that makes your narrative uh, look stupid, makes fun of it, and how l likely is it that you will ignore opposite information? So if you believe in a chemical wake, uh, you, I would like to know whether you follow that. Um, and then I see whether if I show you an image uh, that uh, there is Viagra in it, uh, but there's another image uh, that they don't exist uh, and how you react to them. It's an experiment, stupid experiment. And apparently, the result is that those who follow scientific information will measure themselves against that and plot theories uh, will um, follow their own, meaning that people seek information in people that like, think likewise. Um, so clearly, if I, for example, am a football fan for Juventus, uh, I will surround myself uh, by friends uh, who do exactly the same thing on social media. It's the echo chamber, that's what it's called. I surround myself of people Oh, who share this information. Clearly, I'm not going to go and surround myself with people I don't like. Uh, that's the human tendency. How do people react uh, the, to information that make fun? They choose them, uh, choose them as a plot or conspiracy theories. Um, but this is the result. How do users react to the fact uh, that um, they don't even look at them. They don't look at the debunking. The, for example, debunking posts um, on Twitter and the internet only are looked, are looked at only mostly by the people who are the same community and a very small group. So that 5%, uh, if it works, it's effective. Nope. Why? We went to see how active uh, those people were on the alternative uh, sources. We checked them, checked uh, their ex exposure response to the debunking post and their, after their exposure. The increase is in conspiracy theory. If they tell me to that you, you, my Juventus team is not good, I go back to my echo chamber and look for confirmation. It's called the backfire effect. We developed a model, and basically, the last ingredient, and then I've finished, is the following. Two users on social media share the same narrative, when they comment, the more the comments, the more negative they are. So there is a trend towards the negative side. This, this corresponds to a hypothesis by Kath Stanstein, who wrote a book with Kahneman, and I wrote an article with um, Sunstein of the group polarization, two users 
juries in particular were his subject, um, users uh, who talk and share the same position when they have to explain it to others must be tend to be more extreme uh, than if they speak about it alone. So two Juventus football team fans are more extreme than one. This is the last of the ingredients. And it's not just a matter of uh, social media, but internet. Uh, this comes from various blog and separate analysis and so on. It's a universal mechanism. There is a great sea of information. It's like a supermarket. Before, we had a sort of little shop of information, and a grocer shop. Now we have a hypermarket of information. I pick the one which I like best, which uh, is more consistent with my vision of the world. And since I ended up there, I comment and I share and I find other people who are there for the same reason. And that's how you get together. And we start to work together to reinforce this type of narrative. If uh, we're Juventus football fans, uh, we met on social media, we will share information that we agree it. If there's someone who says that Juventus uh, is an awful team, we either won't uh, share or ignore it. The example now in the past few days, um, immigration. A very brutal topic. On the one hand, you have uh, the narration that says, uh, help them, them there, we don't understand anything on numbers. Uh, some people give one number, some people give us another, but says that, that they have to be stopped and sent back. And the other one that says, uh, and they use fake news for this, on the other hand, we have a narrative that we have to welcome them all. You heard of the child uh, who had uh, his school report uh, and it's not true. It's case, but it was in 2013. So when we communicate, we all exaggerate and we try to find excuses to polarize the information. It's not, one of, it's not by chance, and this is one of our studies, that there is a very strong correlation between the arguments or subjects that polarize public opinion and fake news. The more polarizing it is, uh, the more likely it is that it will be fake news. We still have, uh, a co haven't yet identified the cause effect. It seems to be polarization and fake news, but we haven't proved it yet. So on the whole, this is it. The world has changed, the world of information has changed, and journalists um, is having a difficult time. Scientists are having an even harder time because they have to communicate very Difficult things and people who are involved in science popularization. There's not a popularizer that can popularize everything, all science, because explaining a subject is a very complex and multifaceted thing, except from him. Well, he knows everything. He, he knows him. Please. Who's going to ask the question? I am. With the mic, please. Okay. Rispetto allo studio che avete condotto. In relation to the study that you carried out, did you focus uh, more on people who are subject to fake news or those who produce fake news? The person who can invent something, and for what reason? Are there peop the people who invent uh, fake news, are they, um, have they a particular profile? Do you think that there are people who are more inclined for fake news than others? Uh, well, no. A group of trollers, uh, they deliberately issued fake news uh, to increase the debate and have a good laugh. Uh, this uh, was... Uh, this is for you seeing in the people who received, but what about the people who, have you ever studied those who write fake news? Do they do it out of boredom or what? Some people, there was a report that was issued uh, in November um, the author by the authority, and they give you an part of the information of the fake news. It's increased uh, despite fact checking. Basically, what emerges, uh, 
is that there is a no particular profile. Some people do it because of market reasons, some people make mistakes, and some because they just want to show off. There's a mixture, and it cannot be identified as a natural community except for... So people hide, for instance, uh, sometimes behind uh, a network or something. Thank you. Closing now. At this point, I was going to give the floor to journalists. Once you had these results, how did you experience it emotionally? I changed jobs. Uh, no. I think, um, yes, there's a mess, uh, different sources, it's more and more difficult for us, but uh, I, my tool, if possible, is to take time to analyze and check. This is what journalists do, but the problem, as he was saying, is this uh, mixture of journalism and um, very often, uh, you have to compete with blogs, with non-journalists, uh, and um, we all now have profiles on Facebook and social networks. So we're part of a communication network that is horizontal, and when it's horizontal rather than hierarchical, you ru lose your role. But there's nothing else you can do because we live in the time of um, the Internet and lack of intermediation, so for us it's very complicated. I think that the only tool that we have is uh, to be as serious as possible. Being clear that there is no absolute truth, but there are, there is data, there are data. For example, if I'm talking about countries uh, in uh, Africa that have uh, uh, the French franc or the African franc there, I'm saying something mistaken. I must, first of all, I must know how the, the African franc works, but this is not right because they don't come from those countries. So fact-checking, unlike what he's saying, is very important, but it's important from a journalist's point of view. That is to say, to refer facts or according to the official sources. Unless you want to question official sources, well, fact-checking, uh, knowing whether the checking the facts uh, that we have, is, I don't mind. Uh, um, I don't mind whether it's useful or not. But it's part of journalism. It is journalism, but debunking is something different because it means disassembling uh, uh, fake news, uh, deconstructing it, and reconstructing it. And that is something different. But fact checking, uh, I, I don't even ask myself whether it's useful. You do it, and that's it. And you do it at the source. Before say something, I should check it. But if by any chance there's a mistake uh, that I make, or sometimes uh, you, there might be television shows uh, by journalists, uh, where there are political representatives who say something that is inaccurate at that moment, you must say, no, you may have an opinion, but the facts are different. But sometimes they can be, sometimes journalists make a mistake in good faith. They don't know, they ignore things because we are less socialized, we have to deal with more and more things, and so we also have to compete with those who don't do our work, uh, but who circulate information that we consider valid. Loss of faith against the elites and journalists, uh, because it's a considered an elite like Wujab. Complex problem, a social political problem. I agree on this. Uh, and uh, starting with what Walter was saying, I would like to talk about these dynamics and over-information. You will notice a scientific, uh, and a citizen, um, as a user, I also notice and I'm concerned with the fact, uh, and what I feel overwhelmed by is not fake, but over-information, chatting. For instance, uh, 
I'm frustrated when I enter social media and I see that people talk, 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 say about Lino Banfi, who's an Italian actor. It might be anything else. Sir. There are topics that are very important, uh, such as climate, uh, climate change, uh, that uh, find it difficult to, to emerge. Uh, the problem, I'm saying something which is not uh, my thinking, and I don't know where I read it. We will check it, we will check it. The media don't tell us what to think, but what to think of. They determine the agenda, it has been said. They set the agenda. So the fact that there are topics that are very important, uh, such as climate change, uh, that are really, well, in 10 years, we're go but even now, we have to deal with the if social and economic disasters, and not only due to climate change, and people are not talking about it. Well, they do at conferences, and specialists talk about it. But we fail to impress it on people, also because of those mechanisms, those cognitive mechanisms that we were talking about. Earthquakes, yes, could be now or in 100 years, but who can say? So we continue to postpone, postpone and postpone. And sooner or later, it's uh, the world, it's reality that will focus our attention. Attention is today's currency. Everybody competes for attention, to attract. The daily amount of glucose that our brain has to brain to process all the information. And in this, so we lose bits of reality. Not so much that uh, of course, there is climate change negationism, but there is indifference uh, more like that, uh, which concerns me a bit more. And we're more concerned with truth, uh, but yes, we're more concerned of what remains hidden in the sea of information. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody. Scalari, Vicini, Quattrociocchi, there's time maybe for a couple of questions, and in the meantime, I would like to ask uh, Piero Benucci, in the 57 years, uh, you've come across a lot of fake news before and after the internet. Yes, I also produced uh, sometimes, unwittingly, but sometimes pushed by directors. That is also true by the editors-in-chief. I would like to know if you're more confused or clear about it. I'm more confused. That was our aim. I've written things, but there are too many comments. But the first one is, uh, we're born to believe. This has been proved in a convincing manner. You can check this, but um, it's neuroscience proves this, uh, and trust has a value in evolution. The human species developed because there is mutual trust amongst the members of the species. At 2 a.m., a baker gets up, bakes bread, it trust, trusting the fact that the next day people are going to buy bread. That's how the world works because we have a mutual trust. The, the fact that, that this uh, trust uh, covenant uh, is not only betrayed, which would be random, but it is all, it, the, the betrayal is organized. Uh, and this is one of the topics uh, that we should analyze. Now we are facing a betrayal that is organized, pre-organized, based uh, on a biologically fundamental or key mechanism. So I would be aware. The other point which I would raise, yes, the b fake news is not nude. Herschel, for instance, uh, had difficulty in defending himself because he was in South Africa while the fake news uh, came out because uh, the sun tripled their sales, three articles, and every time they tripled sales, then they were disproved. But this fake news is sort of uh, 
uh, I feel I'm on the side of the journalist, really, that produced, because uh, he was very good for the uh, circulation numbers. But today, it's a bit different. And the fact that, that there the fact that there's always been fake news is no good. I mean, it's not an extenuating circumstance in any way. One day they, we will be asked uh, why we why we were silent and Mentana introduces news starting to orient it. They, we will be asked to answer. The other thing that I'd like to say, and I've written nine points, but I'll be very quick. I would like to make a difference between insult and mistake. Uh, because neither of them are fake news. They are things which, again, we have to come to terms with. If you have a mistake, you can rectify it. You can then discuss whether it's not twice the mistake. But uh, I wouldn't mix everything together, because this really creates confusion. Not bad information, but and that's dangerous. The third point, to which I would like to mention, I wrote them here. The fourth is this, that while I listen or read a tweet by a politician or I see something on Facebook, um, I should ask myself, why are they doing this? Why are they not at work? Why are they not at work? No. We report their tweet, their non-work. We send their Facebook on TV. Can I say something? There are journalists, and I'm not going to mention their names, uh, who in the misuse of Twitter, they have damaged their public image. Italian journalists, unlike the US one, have never had a self-regulation on how they were using it. You were speaking on, are you talking on behalf of Repubblica, La Stampa, Corriere? I don't notice a great interest or focus. Please excuse my interruption. No, I agree. And I would add something. When we see a politician who goes to a demonstration, a public demonstration, and uh, is wearing a uniform, the fake news is me with a camera when I film him because I am broadcasting someone who is dressed up or should not be, is abusing the situation. The information that I give is not that, but that he is speaking about that. But the real fake news is that that person there doesn't exist because it's not him, he's someone else. He's wearing the police uniform. This is what I would like people to understand. You produce more contents in a day or month than in the previous 2,000 years. Yes, but in the 2,000 years, there's a filter. We've only got the good information of this month. We've had the worst, but in two months, we won't know it. So. I, the historical filter, I think, is uh, the, very important. A lot of other things uh, which uh, really made me angry. Truth, uh, very long. Truth doesn't exist, I was told. Probably there are interpretations. I come from Luigi Pari's own school, which is the philosophy of interpretation. So, but between the arbitrary nature and the freedom of interpretation, there's a difference. It's very difficult to understand, but uh, if you say give an arbitrary statement and an interpretation is different. Maybe you can't explain it, but you know it's different. So I would ask a journalist, uh, please, good faith in your interpretation rather than abuse or misuse. Truth, uh, there's an ontological truth with that you cannot attain. We can't, as journalists, uh, have it. Uh, this is something which the archbishop maybe can do if uh, you're a believer. But there is a truth uh, which you can test, uh, verifiable, and that's what we call fact-checking. You've always had this, uh, and it isn't a truth. It's simply that you check it with fact. Uh, explaining how you check facts or you verify is useful because it makes you aware of what you're doing. 
I would like to conclude, because otherwise it's too long, with saying the fact that noise is a big problem. You said that very clearly, the fact that in the end, Everybody has to say something. It doesn't matter whether it's true or false. That is the real problem. Try to switch off uh, your mobile phone for a few hours. You'll see that you're in another world. Suddenly, you're in a better world. And I have been involved in information and still live on it because luckily I still haven't. Uh, I still haven't. Uh, um, uh, taking my pension, I'm still a freelance, and that's how I live. Dobbiamo chiudere. Ringraziamo ancora Antonio Scalari, Antonella Vicini, Walter Quattrociocchi e Piero Bianucci.